we are going to talk about message passing interface MPI. Okay, so we're going to talk about basic MPI. It turns out um, there's this ship that makes uh, offshore um, windmills, and it is called the MPI Adventure. Who knew? Okay, so we're going to talk. We're going to we're going to introduce you to MPI. We're going to talk through a few uh, parallel programming concepts. We're going to learn the six necessary MPI commands to, in order to write a program, uh, pretty much any program that you want in parallel. Uh, it may not be the most optimal way to write it, but you can with these six commands write any any code that you would need to. And we're going to look at an example. Okay, so the message passing interface, MPI, is a standardized and portable message passing system designed to function on a wide variety of parallel computing architecture. So it is a standard. That's what MPI is. If somebody says, what is MPI? It's a standard. Uh, it has evolved over the years um, in order to accommodate advances in hardware and programming practices. And it is a long, long, long document that you could read with your reading pleasure if you, um, especially if you are experiencing insomnia, I might recommend it, okay? So uh, MPI standard is implemented into libraries by many vendors and also there are open source implementations too. So, um, most companies have their own implementations. If they sell supercomputers, they have their own implementation that they developed. Um, and then the two main um, open source versions are MPitch, and that was originally developed out of Argonne National Lab and Mississippi State University, and it's still actively developed. And then OpenMPI is another one, um, and that's developed at a lot of other national labs like Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and a few others, um, and then also with other partners. The, uh, the MPI function library is what we use to write uh, high performance computing programs when we're using C, C++, or Fortran. And those are actually the most common languages uh, that are used in this field. Um, Python is kind of growing uh, and it's getting more popular every day, uh, but Python is not a compiled language like C, C++, and Fortran are. Um, and so things are a little different in the case of using Python. There is a there is like a, a, a Python library uh, that's MPI for Pi is one of them that you can use uh, for parallelization using MPI. But we're going to focus on these compiled languages rather than interpreted languages like Python. Okay. So there have been many different versions of MPI. So MPI-1 was made in uh, 1994. And it, it, you know, it was a really good, useful standard at the time. Um, in MPI-2, they released the standard two years later and introduced some extensions like dynamic process management, parallel IO, and one-sided communications. Um, MPI-3, was released in 2012, so quite a bit after that. Uh, and so then there was even more non-blocking collective operations, uh, one-sided communications, um, and, and better support for shared memory programming, which is what we're gonna talk about in the afternoon and, um, with OpenMP. And uh, they also added support for the Fortran 2008 standard. So I know a lot of people think Fortran is like some kind of a dead language, but Actually, Fortran is very, very popular in high performance computing. This Fortran stands for formula translation. It's really good at that. It's really good at crunching numbers. Very, very efficient language for that. So people still widely use Fortran in this field. Um, and then MPI 4.0 was released in 2021, and that had additional uh, enhancements and new features, um, including partition communications. Um, so this is where they have to start taking into account GPUs and other sort of uh, offloading devices like that. Um, persistent collectives that um, ex extend 
I, I, I can't say I've ever used persistent collectives myself. Um, additional fault tolerance. So fault tolerance becomes a big deal. You know, your, your computer is unlikely to fail, right? But if you had 10,000 of your computer, one of them failing becomes highly likely, right? So uh, when we're when we're talking about running across a big supercomputer that could have ten thousand nodes, um, you have to you have to be concerned about fault tolerance. So um, increasing the ability to recover from fault from faults happening is a pretty big important deal. Um, and then of course some additional enhancement for high, hybrid programming um, that again we're going to talk about in the afternoon, but mostly we're really gonna stick to kind of the basics that you would learn in uh, that that were um, created in the MPI 1.0 and 2.0 standards. We're not really gonna go above that. I mean, I would say you could probably spend a lifetime on the MPI standard. Um, you know, there are people who do that. So we're just, we're, we're just gonna, barely scratch the surface, like I said. If you want to, if you want 900 pages of bedtime reading, that will be very effective bedtime reading, then read the MPI standard. That'd be my advice. Okay, so something else I want to mention about parallelizing stuff is there are two sort of primary programming paradigms in parallel. So the first one is called SPMD, that stands for Single Program Multiple Data. And then the second one is MPMD, and that's multiple programs, multiple data, and you can use MPI for either one of these. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by this. So single program, multiple data is where you're going to write a single program that's going to perform exact same tasks on multiple sets of data. So you could think of it, you know, in our in our cooking example as multiple chefs baking many lasagnas, right? They're applying the same recipe to the same type of ingredients. It's not literally the same cheese as the other person is using, right? But it literally, you know, the same type of thing. They're doing it over and over again. Um, and then also, if you think about uh, an area that, that uses high-performance computing that, that you may not have thought about is like uh, the folks at Pixar, right? They they render different frames of a movie. They, they're doing basically the same act on each frame, and so that would be a, a, an SPMD example. Um, MPMD is where you're writing different programs to perform different operations on multiple sets of data. So it, back to our cooking analogy here, uh, if we had multiple chefs preparing a four course dinner and each of them is making a different part of the dinner, then that would be MPMD. Um, and then back to the, the Pixar example, if we're rendering maybe different parts of the movie frame within within each frame, so one person, you know, or one process is working on Shrek, and one process is working on Princess Fiona, and another one is working on the tree in the background, then um, that would be an example of rendering uh, different parts of the movie frame, and that would be an MPMD operation. Um, and then you can also write a hybrid program where some processes perform the same task and others perform different tasks. So, so maybe Shrek and Princess Fiona and the tree are all in a very long scene. So, uh, you know, in some sense, that is an SPMD operation, right? Each frame has all of those things in it. Um, but within the frame, there are these different components where you're performing different operations. Okay, does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay, so we've had this whirlwind tour now where we talked about what MPI is. We've talked about these different um, programming paradigms. Now we're going to talk about the six MPI commands that you need in order to write any parallel program, perhaps badly. Okay, so they are MPI init, MPI finalize, MPI com size, MPI com rank, MPI send, and MPI receive. We're going to go over these in pairs. So. Yes. So, um, are this applicable to both um, Open MPI and MPI? Yes. Yes. So the MPI standard says if you're going to make an MPI library, you need to have a function called MPI init, and it needs to have these arguments. And if you're going to make an MPI finalize, it needs to be like this. Okay. So it specifies like 
how it's supposed to behave and, and how the user would interface with it. So then underneath that, like how, what does MPI init actually do underneath it? What variables does it set? You know, that kind of thing. That is up to the implementation. So MPitch and uh, OpenMPI, they look identical to the user. But if you actually look through their codes, they're gonna be different. Does that make sense? Excellent question, thank you for asking. Uh, second question, please. Yeah. You mentioned that you're going to discuss um, open MP in the afternoon. So is is this um, for distributed memory or for shared memory? So MPI is for distributed memory. Okay. Yeah, parallelism and MP, uh, open MP is for shared memory parallelism. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Thank you for asking that too. Any other questions before we go on? Anything on line? Okay. All right, so the first thing we need to know about is initiation and termination. So we need to start up MPI and we use MPI init to start up our program, okay? And so we place this function in the body of our code after we declare all of our variables and before we do any MPI commands. Okay, if you place it, if you do MPI commands before MPI init, that is an undefined behavior. Um, and so what this does is it initializes the MPI execution environment. Okay. Um, so basically what it does underneath is it coordinates all of these different processes that are going to start up. And it and it kind of assigns them roles. In, in what we call the MPI comp world. Um, and I think I have a diagram after this that will explain this better. Okay, so then at the end of our code, at, at, when our program is done, we wanna shut down MPI. So we wanna uh, put it near the end of our code after our last MPI command, and it's gonna terminate the MPI execution environment. So you can't call any other, uh, you can't call any MPI functions, except for if you wanted to reinitialize or refinalize. Those are the only things you could call after MPI finalize. Okay, so here is, this is my diagram that I was gonna describe to you here. So we've got um, our program and the world that our program lives in. And that's kind of that light blue circle there. And we call that the MPI comp world. Okay, that is a variable, a macro, I think, that is that is defined by your uh, MPI. And, and it represents like all of the processes that are active in your code when you have invoked it, okay, when your code starts running. Um, and then in real life, we've got our supercomputer cluster, okay? In this particular one, we have two CPUs per, Code. It just, you know, this is fit. This is just easy data. And so, so something like the Slurm scheduler, which I think you may have learned about if you took our um, intro to NERSC class um, the other week. Uh, so, Slurm basically says, okay, you know, Rebecca's job is going to run. I'm going to give it these nodes. I'm going to give it node one, two, three, and four. Those are the nodes that Rebecca's job is going to run on, okay? And I said, I need six MPI ranks. They go from zero through five. Um, and so then Slurm says, okay, well, and, and the MPI really is the one who, who figures this out. But it says, okay, rank zero is going to actually be on CPU zero of node one. And then uh, rank one is going to be on CPU one of node one, et cetera. And so it assigns all of these, it figures out like what is this mapping from here, from, from code land to hardware land, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so what happens is Slurm will give you these nodes and then Slurm will, um, will start up basically 
six uh, independent um, copies of your software onto these six CPUs that you that you got from Slurm. And then MPI, the NIC comes in and it says, it kind of maps it all. So it says, hey, you, you're a rank zero in, in software land, okay? And you, you're rank one in software land. You're rank two, okay? That's how it works. It's kind of weird to think about it, but yeah, that's, that's how it works. So does anybody have any kind of questions about that or are you still like, whoa? All right. Sort of understand it maybe. Okay, so you remember how I was telling you about how we've got rank zero through five here and we have six, six total MPI processes. So these are the next uh, important um, functions that we need to learn about. And so one of them is MPI com size and the other one is MPI com rank. Okay, so com size is in this case, we have six of them, right? You can see, you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six of them. And then the rank is which individual one am I, right? So let's say that I am CPU zero on node one. So which rank am I? I am rank zero. Okay. Let's say I'm CPU zero on node four. I am rank five. Okay. And, and MPI maps that during the MPI init process. And then uh, you can query that with MPI com rank. You find out the identifier of the current process that is running this code at this moment. Okay, I know it's kind of weird, but if you can think of it as kind of like a play, right? Like, let's say we're all in a play, right? We all have our individual lines in the play, right? And to some, in some sense, your program, your parallel program is a play. And it just tells all the different characters in that play, like which thing they're supposed to be doing in the, in the code, okay? I know it's kind of weird, kind of makes your brain hurt first time you think about this, but hopefully, some of those analogies will kind of make it clear. Okay, so one thing I do want to mention about rank is you saw the ranks go from zero to five when we have six processors. So the ranks are uh, going to be between zero and size minus one. Okay, because we count like C. Does anybody know about how in C you start counting at zero? Right, okay. I see there was a question, so I'm going to try to address the latest question. So somebody was asking about what is the communicator in those definitions? Great question, Shannon. Uh, so the communicator is this thing that gets created by MPI. So what there is a communicator called MPI com world, and that represents all of the processes that are running your job. So you can think of the communicator as kind of like a telephone directory of everybody who is working on your code at the time that it is running. Okay, I know that's a little bit abstract, probably a little strange, but um, if I run my code on six processors, then MPI com world is sort of like the telephone directory to uh, all six of those people. So we can we can you know send them all messages. We can receive messages from each other. We all know that we are involved together in this operation of this code. Okay, I hope that helped, Shannon. Uh, you are unlikely to be the only person with this question. Yeah, okay. MPI com world is like telephone record. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now uh, just to add to your confusion, you can create other communicators. You can create sub communicators depending on what you want to do in your code. So you could create a communicator, for example, that has 
only the even numbered ranks in it, or only the odd numbered ranks, um, or you know, really anything. That's just an example. Um, so I will I will not go much further with that, so that I will minimize your confusion. So that would just be like a sub telephone directory, I guess. Okay, so we've talked about environmental inquiry. Now we're going to talk about actually sending messages. So the first thing is we want to send messages. So we want to send some data from one MPI process to another. And we use the MPI send function. So we put all of our data into this buff parameter. That's the first thing up there. Uh, and, and the count thing means like how many pieces of data of this particular data type, that is the next argument, are we sending, okay? So like, let's say I'm gonna send a bunch of doubles. I wanna send some double precision numbers. So count would be like, how many double precision numbers am I sending that are in my buffer there? So then the next argument there is dest, that's your destination, like which process are you sending it to? Um, tag is like a special tag that, that just kind of can be a special identifier for this particular message because maybe you're sending a bunch of messages and maybe maybe you want to like for certain messages you put it you put a tag on there and then the the receiver says oh okay well if the tag is equal to this I'm gonna do this part of the algorithm and tag is equal to something else I'm gonna do that part of the algorithm so there could be a reason why you want a tag uh, and then the last thing is the communicator. So the phone directory of like, who all is involved in this process, right? You could think of it as a phone directory. You could think of it maybe also as the roster of all of the players in your play. That could be another way to think of it. Okay, so I, I made an example down here. Um, and so this is an example where I'm gonna send from, I have a variable called X. I put a double precision number in it. I said x equals 3.7 something. Um, there's only one of it. So there's all it, because it's a scalar. It's not a vector. It, it's not. It's not an array or anything. Um, so I'm just sending one number. That's why I have this ampersand because that is the address of the location of where x is stored. Okay, because this is c. Um, I'm going to send it to the manager process. A lot of times we'll see people have um, a manager worker, sort of an algorithm where you have one process that's kind of the boss and then you have a bunch of processes that are doing all the work. That's kind of like my day job. And then um, I, I'm just going to choose me. I'm just saying that's like my process rank number that is going to be used as my tag. And then MPI com world, that's like the world directory of everyone who is involved. In, in this uh, computation right now. Okay. So hopefully that sort of made sense. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions about send because it's kind of a big deal. Correct. Dest of five would be going to node four CPU zero. Correct. Okay. Who assigns the rank to the compute cores? Is there an MPI demon? Um, so that gets assigned in MPI init. So Slurm delivers up these nodes or you know whatever you're requesting. Um, and then um, I'm not exact, you know, I'm not exactly sure how it all works because I haven't exactly read their code. But that's the basic idea. Slurm delivers you, Slurm delivers to MPI, you know, we have all these nodes. And then Slurm will also, through SRUN, it will launch, you know, n different um, invocations of of your uh, of your code across all of the resources that you have requested. And then it's up to MPI in MPI init to figure out like which which one of these is going to be uh, process zero, which one is going to be process one. So MPI really is the one that that makes those kind of decisions. So that's a great question. Thanks, Joe. Um, Subcommunicators are like an area code within a large city for phone numbers. I like that, Denzel. 
Subcommunicators are like an area code within a large city for phone numbers. Excellent, excellent thought. Yes, um, the, the difference is though, that you're gonna actually have a different phone number within the subcommunicator, okay? So that's why I didn't really wanna talk about it. Yeah. Um, on this example here, like, how do you know from, from the sender's perspective to the manager's perspective, like what? Okay, yeah, this is just like a clip from another code. So you would have already uh, figured out that manager equals processor zero, for example. Right. So so that that would have been set to zero if, okay. if so that was your like send ID to all the other processors. Well, what you would do is you would establish in your code, you would decide, I want so typically uh you always have a process zero, but you may or may not always have a process 27, for example, right? Like if you ran on 10 processes, you wouldn't have a process 27. So uh so typically if you're if you have kind of a manager worker algorithm. You just arbitrarily decide from the beginning, process zero is the manager and everyone else is a worker. Okay. Yeah, because you kind of you want to like minimize the amount of communication that you actually do, because communication is pretty slow compared to computation. Right. So if you can just kind of agree upon certain standards from the beginning within your code, uh, and then you don't have to do as much communication, then that really helps. You're like allowed to assign a manager process to ID zero. Yeah, as long as you know that from the get-go. Yeah. You would you would do that like at the beginning of your program. You'd be like manager equals zero. You know, int manager equals zero for your manager make. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Still a little unclear on some of the variables. Okay. Sure. So let's try it again. So we have a buffer of stuff that we want to send to another processor, okay? Right, because we got we got something in our code we're going to send. You know, there's plenty of applications for why you might be wanting to send something. But one of the easiest ones I think for people to understand is you're trying to find the potential energy within a region of space. And it has, you know, I don't know, it, it, it has like atoms in it, okay? And they have different um, charges and they have different types of effects on the potential energy. So you would calculate, you, what you would do is you would take your, your space, and you would divide it up into pieces. And in each piece, you would be doing some calculations, but you kind of need to know information from your neighbor pieces in order to complete your calculation. And in order for them to complete their calculation, they need information from you. So that would be an example of stuff that you would send. So you would send information about what's happening on the border between what I'm doing and what my neighbor process is doing, okay? So I would put, you would put all of that into something that would be, in this case, what is called the buffer, okay? And so that's probably an array of values. And so the question then would be like, well, how many values uh, am I sending? So that's this count thing. That's, oh, I'm going to send because, you know, our border has, we have, uh, you know, 20 elements in common on the border. I'm going to send you 20 pieces of information. And the information that I'm sending you is the potential energy right there at that border. Uh, and so that's just a, a number, right? That's just like a double precision number. So that would be my data type, okay? And, and in this case, I did that. It's MPI double is what we what we use in here. Uh, and then the destination is like, who am I sending this to? So I'm sending it to my neighbor in this case that I'm just making up here off the top of my head. And then I might put in a tag of some sort to uniquely identify this as being the potential energy that I'm sending you, because I might also be sending you some other type of data. Okay, so maybe I would special make a special tag that like, if it's potential energy, then tag equals one. And if it's uh, something else than tag equals zero. I don't know. I would I would establish this type of standard within my code so that everybody would know expectations already, like what's going to happen here. And then the communicator, that would be our com um, communicator. So the, the all of the whole uh, world of within the uh, within the code that's running, everybody that you would want to 
be in communication with for this particular operation. Okay. It's kind of like you can think of it as the context of this destination. Okay. Okay, so hopefully that explained it a little bit better. So now we're gonna talk about receive. Uh, so with MPI receive, it's, you know, it's kind of the, the parallel of the send, right? So we need to receive this information into a buffer, right? So we need it and we need to know uh, like how many things that we're gonna receive. Usually you can calculate that. Right, so if we're talking about our potential energy calculation, uh, if somebody's sending me two, 20 things, I should know that they're gonna be sending me those 20 things. Like I should know that there are 20 things that they're sending me, I should be able to calculate that. So I would calculate that and I would put that number here, um, whatever the data type is, and then who's sending it to me? I should know who it is. I should be able to figure that out. And then the special tag maybe, if I know that I need to match the special tag, I know that I'm waiting for some information about the potential energy, so I'm gonna set the tag to be one. Uh, the communicator, and then there's an additional variable here called the status. And what that does is that reports to you like, hey, did this work? <laughs> uh, or did it fail? Now, I should mention that the receive operation is a blocking operation, this function in particular. So. Basically, I'm, if, if, if I'm expecting a receive, I'm gonna be standing here with my hand out until the end of time or until the computer gets shut down or until you send me something. And hopefully you're gonna send me something so that I don't have to wait until the beginning, until the end of time. Um, so here's an example. This is, this is parallel to this previous example. So I'm gonna receive a double. I know that it's coming from the source and that they're, tag was this was their um, identity and then MPI com world and then um, I'm gonna see this the success or failure of this operation in this status variable okay does that make sense to people is there any questions on the MPI receive okay. yeah so um essentially do you need to um you need to run this. So how do you use this with um, MPI send on different nodes? Is my right, so it would be on different. So there would have to be a corresponding send and receive on two different processes, right? So the same program, just that so you're running multiple copies on different. Right, right. So it kind of depends on what you're doing, okay? Uh, but you... Um, it, it really depends on your algorithm, okay? Um, and I'm going to show you an example that's kind of like a trivial example that kind of illustrates this, but you, but you have to make sure that you have a matching send and receive, okay? So if you, like, this is something that I did when I was really learning how to use MPI. I got a friend and I printed out my pro two copies of my program and I kept one and they they looked at one and we went through line by line and then they were like, okay, I'm about to receive. And I'm like, wait, I haven't sent you anything yet, right? So you need to make sure that there's corresponding sends and receives. Yeah. What do you do if you have a variable length of message? So do you have to like take a size and then uh, add is it rose until it fills the whole thing, or can you send a message shorter than the count? Good question. Yes, you can send a message shorter than the count. The count is the maximum size of the message. And so your buffer would need to be of a size that it could receive that much data in it. Great question, though. Yeah. Is it ever the case that when you receive, like your hands are full, but the other person's like ready to send to you again? Yeah, that could definitely happen. Is that like a so if so let's say that I'm trying to receive a whole bunch of messages so those are, the other messages are just going to wait until I've finished processing the first one and then I'll process the second one yeah great question okay so like I mentioned before receive is blocking so 
it's going to return only after the receive buffer contains the message that you're asking for. Okay, so this can be super tricky and annoying. So you could be sending the right message, but you could have the wrong tag and the tags don't match. And if that's the case, then it won't receive it. So you have to be really careful to make sure that everything matches up. Um, and then send may or may not block until the message receives. It typically, it will block, especially for a large message, um, but it depends on the implementation. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense, right? Like if, have you ever, <laughs> have you ever been neglectful and not uh, emptied out your mailbox in a timely manner? Has anybody ever done that before? No, I've never done, I've certainly never done that before. I've only heard about it. So I'm going to tell you about what happens when that happens. Um, so if you, if it's a letter, you know, your mailbox is mostly full. And if there's another letter, usually they'll just shove it in there, right? Right, and then you have an even fuller mailbox. But if somebody's sending you a package and it won't fit in your mailbox, then um, they don't deliver your package, right? They send you a note that says, hey, we have your package. And then you have to clear out your mailbox and then they'll deliver your package. But if you never uh, clear out your mailbox, then they keep the package and they might send it back. Okay, so it's the same with MPI. If it's a little message, they don't risk it. They'll just stuff it in your mailbox that's a little bit full. If it's a big message, first they're gonna send a, a messenger that says, hey, we're sending you a big message. And if you're not ready for it, then they won't send it. But once you're ready for it, then they will send it, okay? So it kind of depends on the implementation and the size of the message and a few things like that. Um, but basically it, it will usually block until it can safely copy that message into the system buffer. Um, and maybe the, uh, the receiver hasn't actually received the message, but at least the, the message is in a safe place and they can receive it at a later time. Okay, so because of this, we really need to watch out for deadlock. Like I was saying, you gotta make sure that your sends and receives all match up and match up correctly. Excuse so, me, can I ask a yeah. question about um, the correspondence between send and receive. I'm wondering if it's that you need to always have a receive that contains the appropriate like tags and source and destination um, for a specific send, or if you need like the same number of code lines that have send as the number of lines that have received. Like I'm imagining a case where you have um, on some processor, a loop that's going to send data every time it finishes the loop. Mm -hmm. And every single time it sends, it will have the same tag because it's the same type of data. Do you mm -hmm. need on your, maybe like your manager, an MPI receive that just has like the correct tag to receive that message? Or do you also need like a loop to receive individually for every packet of data? Yeah, so you would need you would need to have, uh, yes, you would need it to match up on the tag and the, and the um, origin, you know, whoever sent it, and you would need enough of them to, to receive every one. So, so you, would, like, you would have a loop probably. So if, if you okay. knew, you know, if you, if processor one was going to send to processor zero 27 times, then you would need a loop for processor zero that would receive 27 times. I see. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the thing is like your compiler is not going to detect that whether that's right or wrong. So that's going to be kind of up to you to detect. You will find that there is a hang or something if you don't, if they're not matching. And that'll be the symptom that you will see, but the compiler can't tell, you know, I mean, yeah. I think like uh, you can't you can't tell you can't tell like if a if a program will terminate. Right? You can't even tell that. So oh. how would you be able to tell if it has the right number of sends and receives that match? Right. right. So that's up to the human brain. That's why we're here. I have a couple of questions yeah. then. Um, so does that mean that you're going to run um, or you're going to execute? Like exact same code on the different nodes. Um, because I'm a bit familiar with there's this tool called Seal that has um some 
I think it's similar also to open end. You need like shared memory programs where like portions of the code, like for example, you can parallelize the loop to run on probably like different worker cores. Mm -hmm. um, so is it something similar to that? Are you executing the same exact same code on the different nodes or is, are you executing it? Great question. Are we executing the exact same code on all of our MBI processes or is it different? Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, we are executing the same executable, okay? So it, it, yes, like, you know, you compile your code and there's like a dot out, right? Like, like by default, that's the name of, of the output of the, of the binary, okay? So each process is executing a dot out. However, they could be in different places in a dot out, right? So it could be, you could, you could be really explicit about it and you could say, okay, if I'm process zero, then I'm going to execute the function called manager, okay? And if I'm not process zero, then I'm going to execute the function called worker, okay? And those functions could be two separate files, right? So like if you paused your code right there and you got a debugger, you could see that process zero is in line 83 of, of uh, manager.c and you know, process one is in line 128 of worker.c, right? But there's those are still part of the same binary called a dot out, right? So they would just be kind of doing the, doing the commands that are in a different part of that binary. That is a great question. Thank you for asking. Let's see if there's anything good here. If a message lacks a corresponding receive. That information is kept on the disk to be potentially accessed later. Probably, Nate, probably that message is kept on the disk to be potentially accessed later. And hopefully you would have a corresponding receive at some point that would receive that information. Um, the, the thing is, you know, like I said, it's kind of up to the implementation about whether that uh, whether that gets stuffed into your very full mailbox or whether they keep it and eventually give up. Okay. So we're talking about the deadlocks is like the number one problem that beginning uh, MPI programs have. They can occur, if, like I said, if your sends and receives don't match or they're not properly ordered, uh, if processes are waiting on each other. So to avoid deadlocks, you want to ensure that you have properly matched uh, send-receive operations. If you're really brave, you can use non-blocking communication functions, which we're not really going to talk about today, but there are some called MPI I send, MPI I receive. And if you just, you send and you just fire it off and you just hope that somebody receives it. And the MPI I receive, it doesn't block until it receives something. It just, eventually it'll receive it, hopefully. Or you can, sometimes you can just ch change your program structure to avoid these kinds of deadlocks. So here's an example code, and this code always deadlocks. And um, the thing that this code does for a purpose is demonstrate deadlock, okay? So this is a really dumb code that isn't actually useful in real life. But it illustrates deadlock, and that's what's important here. So, um, so we start up our code here. On the first first line, we have pound include mpi.h. Okay, that includes the MPI headers library, so that when um, when your function is, or sorry, when your code is being compiled, uh, what will happen is the compiler will say, "Oh, I've never heard of this MPI." Uh, in it thing, but then it'll it'll look through uh, this file called mpi.h that has a definition of that thing. And then it'll be like, oh, okay, that's cool. I've heard of that now, so we can proceed. Um, um, and then I also have include standard io.h, which is so that we can print things. So um, in C, the way this goes is you have a main function and you have int rc, care rv, and that, that has to do with the input values on the command line. 
but we won't worry about that for now. So then I define all of my variables. So I've got me, which is gonna be my rank, the rank of the, the process that is running the code at this moment. NP is gonna be the number of total processes. That's gonna be the size. Um, Q is just gonna be my variable of, that I'm gonna put stuff in. And send to is gonna be the, the identity of my neighbor that I'm gonna send to and receive from. Um, I need an MPI status for my send, or sorry, for my receive function. I need, uh, and then I just start my program, right? So I do MPI init, and then I figure out the size of the communicator, and I figure out which rank I am. Okay, so that's what MPI com size and MPI com rank do. Now, this code, you need an even number of, uh, of ranks. So if we don't have an even number, we're just going to exit because code won't work. Otherwise, if I'm an odd number rank, then I'm going to send to my neighbor minus one, me minus one, okay? And if I'm an even number rank, I'm going to send to me plus one. So if I'm process three, I'm going to send to my friend process two, okay? And if I'm process uh, four, then I'm going to send to my friend process five. Okay. So we're going to exchange ranks. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, receive from them what their rank is or what my rank is actually. No, no, what their rank is. Okay, good. I confused myself for a second. So I'm going to receive from them what their rank is. And then I'm going to print it out. Well, I'm going to send them what my rank is. And then uh, I'm going to print it out. I'm going to say, I sent my rank, you know, so I'm process three. I sent three to process two, and I received two for process two. That's what that print statement is going to print out at the end. And then I do MPI finalize because I'm done with MPI. And I do return zero because that's what you do at the end of a C function. Okay, so. This code will always deadlock. And the reason is because I, I'm, if you think about it, let's say I'm one of the processes, let's say you're my partner process, okay? So if we move down this sequence of things, you know, first we initialize our variables, then, then we figure out like what our rank is and who we're gonna send to. And then we wait to receive something, right? And we're doing this in lockstep. We're doing the same thing together. So we're both sitting here waiting forever for the other person to send. But because send is blocking, the other person is never going to, or I'm sorry, receive is blocking. We're never going to send because we never get out of receive. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so here's another way that we could do it. We could just switch the send and receive, right? So first we're gonna send and then we're gonna receive. This will work if we don't mind getting a letter into our stuffed mailbox, right? So this will work because this is just a tiny message, right? It's just a, a single integer. You can stuff another single integer into that mailbox. But if it was a big package, it would not work. It would not fit in the mailbox. So we would not receive a message. It would deadlock, okay? So how can we um, actually resolve this so that it will always work? Anybody have any ideas? Well, we could just decide who sends first and who receives first, right? So the easiest way to do that would be like this. So if I'm an even number rank, then I'm going to send first and receive second. And if I'm an odd numbered rank, then I'm going to receive first and send second. Does that make sense? So now I'm process zero, you're process one. I'm going to send you something. Meanwhile, you're receiving from me. Perfect. 
matching send and receive. Next, I'm going to receive while you're sending. Perfect. Matching receive and send. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions there? Let's see. Yes, thank you, Shababrat, for having the, you had that idea too. Um, and yeah, Sam, we could use a manager to coordinate everyone sending and then everyone receiving. That could work, but uh, like I said, we want to kind of minimize the amount of times that we need to send any messages. And so if we have a manager coordinating, then we're going to have to uh, send a lot of messages. And that's going to be annoying. Yeah. Oh, and Alexander, you had the same idea, I think, as Shibar brought. Stagger who sends first and who receives first based on parity and rank. You got it. Okay. Okay. And then Shiv, you had a really good point that if if there's a message that gets sent and it never ever gets received within the program, then when the program terminates, what happens is Smarm comes in and it cleans up the node. And so it's going to delete anything that got sent. So yeah, they'll never be seen again after the, the program terminates. So your only hope would be if there was some kind of a receive during the program execution. Okay. Let's see. Yes, Lydia, that is another way that we could do it is that each one sends to the one above it. Um, and it would be kind of a round, yeah, round robin sort of a thing. We could do it that way. Um, that's not the way we chose to do it. You would still face the same problem though if everybody tried to receive first. So really the only way to do it is to just figure out like, which one is going to send first and which one is going to receive first. So that would be a different, if you were doing it like that, where, you know, zero sends to one, one sends to two, two sends to three, three sends to four, et cetera, uh, you would have to figure out how to decide which one of those is going to be the receiver first and which one is going to be the sender first. Okay. So um, I kind of already told you this, so about why these don't work and why this one could work. Okay, so remember how I told you about how much I like pie? Anybody remember that? It was only like two hours ago, but it probably feels like a lifetime at this point. Okay, so uh, we're gonna compute pi in parallel and so I'm going to explain to you kind of how this works. We may spend a little time on it um, and then we'll move on. But we want to compute pi because like who doesn't who doesn't want to compute pi in this world? Really? Come on, people. Uh, there is a method called the method of darts that one can use to compute pi. That being said, as a numerical methods person, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that this is actually a terrible way to compute pi, and so that you should not do this in real life. But it is a simple way to compute pi that is understandable and that is easily parallelizable. So that is why we are talking about it today. So um, the basic premise that we use for this is that if you think about it, the ratio of the area of a square to the area of a circle that is inscribed inside of that square is proportional to pi, right? Everybody agree with me there? So let me show you a dartboard, right? So let's say we have a dartboard and we have a square around our dartboard um, and the dartboard radius is, is called, is r, you know, length r. Then um, the area of the circle is gonna be pi r squared. The area of the square is gonna be 2r quantity squared, so that's 4r squared. And if we take the ratio of the area of the circle divided by the area of the square, that's pi r squared over 4r squared. The r's cancel, so that's pi over 4. 
Okay, so that's super exciting. Now everybody sees that there's that proportion. But uh, how do we how do we find those areas? Well, let's suppose that we're out in the real world and we randomly threw darts in the general direction of the of the square that has our dart board in it. Um, we could count the number of darts that land inside of the circle, so on the dartboard, and the darts that land outside of the circle in within the square. And then we could take the ratio of these numbers um, to get an approximation to the ratio of those areas. And the quality of our approximation is going to increase with the number of darts that we throw, right? So if we figure that we throw randomly into the square, we're not aiming for the bullseye, right? We're just doing it randomly to kind of cover it, you know, kind of completely. And um, if we figure the ratio of the darts that lands inside of the circle versus the total number of darts that we have thrown, that ratio is going to be close to pi over four. And it's gonna be closer and closer the more darts that we throw, okay? So now that you uh, see that this is why I'm not good at darts, um, we will move on. Um, so anyway, I made a cake one year on pie day because actually I like cake better than pie. I don't tell anybody that. Um, and so I decided I made a square cake and a circle cake and they both had the same diameter. And then I put the circle on top and I put sprinkles on it and there you go. That's my pie cake. So now that you know why uh, my dart scores are so poor, um, how do we simulate this on a, on a supercomputer? Well, a computer of any type. Well, all we gotta do is we gotta decide on the length R and we've gotta generate pairs of random numbers so that uh, they are you know, within negative R and, and positive R. Right, each number is. And then if those lie within the circle, meaning x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared, then we're gonna add one to our tally for things that landed inside of the circle. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna find that ratio of the number that landed inside of the circle to the total number that we threw. Okay, sounds so simple, doesn't it? Yes because it's actually, it's a pretty simple algorithm. So I wrote it for you all. So first, this is my random number generator. Um, oh, sorry, no, this is my actual code. Cool, not the random number generator. Um, and so you see, I have this number of times that it lands inside of the circle, and I have uh, defined a bunch of variables here uh, that, that we need. I've decided that my radius is one because that's easiest. And so our, our radius squared is also equal to one. Um, and so then I'm just, I just have this loop where I just throw some darts. I throw num trials worth of darts and I, I get um, X and Y. And then if X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to R squared, I count it towards the number that are in my circle. And then I compute pi at the end. So pi is gonna be four times the this number that is uh, inside of the circle divided by the total number that we threw. And then I'm gonna print it out, okay? So that's my code. It's not too complicated, I don't think. Um, do we have any questions so far about this code? No questions. Great. And then the last question is in the dot locking example, do we have to manually divide the process into two groups, three groups, four groups? Or would MPI set automatically assign groups to the groups the process is in? So what MPI I send and most importantly I receive would do is it would be what is just called an asynchronous uh, receive. And and that's what you need if you're, yeah, if you're not going to, um, if you if you want to avoid any kind of a deadlock, 
then uh, I receive is what is what you would use. And you periodically, basically what happens is you 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 have a MPI I receive, and then later on you do sort of it's I forget exactly what it, what it is, but you do kind of like a test, like did it receive it yet? Right? I think that's how it works. And um, and then when it received it, then you can act on that uh, whatever that message was. But that that's how you would handle that. So if you used those, on the one hand, yeah, you wouldn't have to divide up into pieces. On the other hand, your code would be a lot more complicated because you would have to be polling periodically to find out whether that message actually came in. Yeah. Okay, so this is my uh, random number generator. It's a, it's a very, very bad random number generator, but it is something that uh, is easy to understand. Um, and it's called a linear congruential number generator, random pseudo random number generator. So uh, basically, what it does is it starts with some with um, you know some kind of initial value here, and then uh, it does this thing where we've got multiplier add-in and the modulo modulo, um, and all of these are mutually prime numbers. Um, and then that way it's able to make totally random, totally random numbers that are unrelated to each other uh, by multiplying the previous number, adding in this other number, and then taking the modular arithmetic and taking the remainder, basically, of this, divided by this. And that's how it works. Okay. And if you're a Fortran fan, we've got a Fortran 90 version here too. And that's it. Okay, so let's talk about how we would parallelize this. And then maybe we will just move on. Should we? We'll just talk about parallelizing and then we can, or do we wanna try it? We have time to try it? Okay, great. So, uh, Let's talk about this. So what tasks in our algorithm, right, our, I'll remind you our algorithm is, we're gonna throw a bunch of darts, we're gonna figure out which one's landed inside, how many landed inside uh, of the circle, and then we're gonna divide that number by the total number that we threw, and we're gonna get pi. Well, pi over four, we'll multiply it by four. Um, so which of those tasks are independent of each other, and what do we have to do sequentially and then we're going to use PCAM to design our parallel algorithm. Okay, so let's talk about partitioning. I guess we should talk about this because I'm giving you all the answers already. But okay, what tasks are independent of each other? You saw the little uh, art there, so I probably gave it away. Um, clip art. Oh. Denzel, you have an excellent question. The pseudo number generator, what stops this from producing the same sequence of numbers every time you run it? Nothing stops it, and that's the whole point. We want we want it to be reproducible. Yeah. Yeah, because, because the thing is, like, if we were trying to debug it and you were getting different random numbers every time, that would make it hard for you to debug what was happening because maybe it, it didn't work right because of the numbers that you got, or maybe it didn't work right because of something in your code. So yeah, you want you want them to be the same. We did it on purpose. Okay, so what tasks are independent of each other? <coughs> what do we have to do in parallel? <coughs> mm, tough crowd today. Yes. Generating the numbers. Okay, but I, I like that, but let's call it throwing the darts. How about that? Each dart throw is independent of the other. Okay. Uh, what do we have to do sequentially in our algorithm? Updating the counter, maybe, but maybe we could figure out a way to do that in parallel. But yes, Denzel, you are you are getting at what I was getting at, which is actually computing pi itself, right? First, we have to throw the darts, and then we have to compute pi, right? We can't compute pi and then throw the darts. Right? That wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't work. 
Okay, so that's so that's kind of the way that we can think of this. So we can throw all these darts in parallel, or at least try our best to make that as parallel as possible, right? And then uh, we can compute pi after that. So the finest grain tasks to maximize potential parallelism. So the finest grain task is kind of like the throw of one dart. Um, and each throw is independent, right? Like if, if you and I are throwing darts randomly at a square dartboard thingy, um, it doesn't matter if I throw the first dart or if you throw the first dart, right? It just matters that the darts are thrown, right? So it can be in any order. Uh, each throw is independent of all of the others. And if we had a huge supercomputer, we could assign one throw to each processor. There is like one out there that has like a million processors. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot to reserve that one for us today. So this may not be practical, but again, right now we're just thinking of how we could subdivide it to maximize the potential for parallelism, not whether it's a good idea. Okay, so then communication. So each processor throws their darts and then they send the results back to the manager, right? That's that's so this is a manager worker sort of an algorithm like like I was mentioning before, right? So it would be kind of like if you're thinking about people in person throwing darts at a dartboard. Um, it would be like you know I throw a dart and then I tell Charles who's tallying everything. Yes, my dart landed inside of of the circle. I, he would tally everything up. <laughs> And then uh, the next person would go. So um, now we're going to talk about agglomeration, where we're going to combine these into coarser grain tasks to reduce the communication requirements or other darts or other costs. I said darts. Okay. So if we want to get a good value for pi, we actually have to use millions of darts. Like I said, I forgot to reserve uh, El Capitan, which has uh, you know a million processors. Sorry, everybody, forgot about that. Uh, so we can't do that. We don't have millions of processors. Uh, furthermore, if you think about it, like that would be that would be kind of like the case we had where you have the ten thousand piece puzzle and you had five thousand people doing it, right? There, it would take longer for the overhead of it than it would to just do do the whole problem yourself, okay? Um, because communication is like super expensive. So um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use a reasonable number of, of dart throws, and, or, or sorry, processes, and we're going to divide them up evenly between our processors so that each one does a share of the work. I realize I have, still have the word process over here. It should be process is, but anyway, that's what we're going to do. And then finally, we're going to talk about mapping. Um, how are we going to map this? Who's going to be the manager? Who's going to be the worker? So the manager is going to be processor zero. The reason is because there's always a zero, but there's not always a 12 or a whatever other number you might choose. So zero will receive the tallies from everybody else, and it will compute the final value of pi. And um, because really this extra overhead work that zero is doing is kind of insignificant compared to the work that we actually have to do for this, then we're gonna say that the manager is gonna also perform their fair share of dart throws, which I know doesn't always happen with all managers, don't always do all the work that, the, that their workers do. Okay, so does this all make sense to people? Is there any questions about our algorithm? Yes. Won't uh, all of the instances generate the same numbers? Ooh, won't all of the instances generate the same numbers? Yes, they will. We will have to figure out how to avoid that problem. You, you, uh, I, usually people don't figure that out yet. And so then that's an extra step that I have to, we, we run it and you actually get worse and worse values in pi, the more processes that you use. So they generate the same random? They would, number? they would generate the same random number, yeah. The dart and the they would all throw the dart at the same place. Yeah. Uh, distance is speed. All the same. It would all be the same. Yeah. 
Yes. How do you know what's the optimal number of processors for your job? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Use the process's ID as the seed for the generator. Yes, you could use the process's ID as the seed for the generator. That is exactly what we will do. Um, and then from that seed, it will still produce the same random numbers every time. You know, from four, it'll always go on to the next number. Same you, next even time. like they all have the same seed. All yeah, they'll all have the same seed same unless you said it. Yeah, that's why they're yeah. Exactly. We, we, the idea is not feeding it with a different seed because we really want them to create the same random number. Right? Well, um, we we don't want them to create the same yeah. random number when we're running in parallel. But we would what but, but what we would want is for for processor <coughs> five, for example, to always create the same numbers that processor five always creates. Well, you know, but like. Uh, if they all create the same numbers, all of them, then effectively what we're doing, let's say we're gonna run it, um, we're gonna do a, a million darts, okay? Let's say we, now we have two processes that are, they're gonna run 500,000 each, right? And then if they do the same numbers, both of them, then you've only run it 500,000 times, right? right. Yeah. Because you have two identical darts that landed in the exact same place. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So you want to clone the assignment to your directory and Perl letter. And then you want to copy out darts.c and lcgenerator.h, whatever, um, from your favorite. Um, from your favorite programming language. And you want to parallelize this code using the six basic MPI commands. And you want to call your new MPI code darts-mpi. Okay. So I was working on this. Uh, I, I paused to answer a few people's questions, so I didn't really finish mine. But here's my, this is my terminal here. So let me just quit out of my code. So here's here's what it did. So um I did this git clone thing. Right? Git clone, blah 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 blah. Yeah, I have the directory. Okay. Um, and so it cloned it. And then I looked at all my directories because I never can remember what the names of my directories are. Uh so I did CP crash course supercomputing. I hit tab and it said, uh, here's your only choice, darn sweet. I don't know if you all know about tab completion, super nice. You hit tab and it completes things for you. If you're a lazy person like me and you don't like to type everything or you're worried about typos, you can just hit tab. So uh, then I remembered, okay, yeah, the directory is called Dart Suite. I need to go into the C one. I need to um, copy this file. And the dot just means it's going to copy it into the current directory where I am right now. Does that make but sense? I um, can't even, when I do the CP, it said it's a missing destination for a file operand after, and it looks the same as what you've typed. Okay, did you have space and then dot? Oh, I'm talking about the I the line after ls that you command after that. Oh, okay, yeah. So this 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 right here, this mm -hmm. is a little bit misleading of a line mm -hmm. because. What it is is it's showing tab completion. So let me just let me do it live again. So copy oh, see. okay. Crash. See, see, so I I, I hit tab because that mm -hmm. if you look at my directories here, oh, if you look at my directories here, the only one that starts with CR is this one. Okay. So then I'm like, oh, but where is it in this directory? I don't remember. So I hit tab again. And what tab did is it it gave me all these choices. Mm -hmm. So I'm not actually copying. This is not an actually a valid line. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then yeah. I hit D because D is the only choice here that, or it's unique, right? And then I, I something's funky C. because I can't even do the darts thing. I don't know why, but it's okay. I'll figure it out. 
Okay. I think maybe if I type it all in myself, maybe it'll Yeah, work. if you type it all in, it should work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. You're okay. welcome. Thank you for helping. No problem. There was one more person with your um, hand up. Who has your hand? Um, nobody anymore, I guess. Okay, well, let's go back to my terminal. I should have stopped, shouldn't have stopped sharing. I'm gonna go back to my terminal here. I'm gonna share with you really fast. Uh, I think my time might be up. Give you a minute. Okay, so give me a minute. Okay, so I started working on my code. Uh, I called it Dart MPI. Let me tell you what I what I've done so far. First thing I did was I include mpi.h, right? We got to include those header files. Second thing that I did was I knew that I was going to need to do mpi init and mpi finalize. So I just went ahead and put those babies right on in there. Okay. Then I knew I was going to need some extra variables. I, I knew that my rank and the size of the communicator are going to be important. So I added those variables. I decided I need to know the size and rank. That's going to be important. So I added those functions in there. And then I set up the number of trials that I'm going to do. Like I'm an individual processor, right? I'm going to do the total number divided by the, the number of, of processes that we have, right? So that's that's as far as I got. And I set that to my num trials. Okay. So that's as far as I got in a couple minutes. And we will leave the rest as a mystery until 